My name is Gabriel Motzkin. I'm the director of the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, and it is my job to open conferences, which I do three or four times a week, and I'm a great pleasure to open this conference. Why? Because when Michael Schaefer came and suggested it to me, I thought this was a wonderful idea, and I think it's something we don't do enough with, and we always need to do more, because we all think we know everything about democracy, and the truth is we know less than we think we do. Now, my first question to you is this, which is that is democracy a stage or is it an end? In other words, it's somewhat, I think, naive to think that any historical regime endures forever. And if it doesn't, then we are invited to think what happens after democracy. And if it does, you know, do, do we get from democracy always to dictatorship? Is there another solution? Is there a model we don't know yet? Now, if you look at modern democracies, this is my second point, you will see that democracy survived in those places where the elites were democratic. If the elites were not democratic, it didn't help. Democracy is an elitist ideal. It could be, you, know, you could say democracy is egalitarian. No. There were many countries where you had mass votes and all the results was that people like Mussolini or Berlusconi or, well, I won't say he who shall not be named in the United States were chosen. And all these people, if you look at them, you will see that in a situation where you have what the Germans would call halb gebildet, half educated people, you often get a demagogic leader who manipulates democracy in favor of election. I don't know what there is to do about that except to have some form of stratified society. But if you look, on the other hand, at Weimar Germany, you see a much more pernicious disease, which is that the elites were against democracy. And if the elites were against democracy, there's not much that can be done. So where, how do you solve this problem? I think the only way you can solve this problem is by, and this is going to be a sort of pablum solution, is I thought, what is it that keeps people democratic? And I realized what the only thing that you can do is make it into the center of your educational system. In other words, make, uh, in America, where I grew up, people in the third grade, third grade means dritte Schuljahr, third grade, Kita Gimel, knew all about who was the mayor, what was the city council, what was the board of education, what were the other models of municipal administration. We learned this when we were eight years old. And I think that's very important to point out. A democracy only works when the citizens know everything about how it works and when the citizens are vigilant. They have to be educated to do that. Now, the question, though, remains what happens after democracy. In the age of the internet, this is very important because maybe the internet is subverting the power of elites. Maybe the fact that people can vote, you know, you get polls on the internet, you get to vote all the time on this or that. Maybe that's changing the basic equation. Is it changing it in a good way? Do we really want to have vote by the masses on every decision that has to be taken this morning in the government? I don't know. Well, I'm going to leave you with these incoherent ruminations, and I'm going to ask Professor Ruth Gavison, uh, our, my distinguished colleague both here and at the Hebrew University, to chair our morning session, and she will introduce the first speaker, and the second speaker, we understand, is on the road. So we hope to see him soon. Okay. Please, Ruth. I'm going to sit in the back. Morning to all. I'm very pleased to be here and open the first session of this, I think, extremely uh, relevant and timely conference because I completely agree uh, with the general statement of the conveners of this conference that it is about time that we look at democracy uh, more critically than we used to over the last two decades. It has been an assumption in Western society and it has been made universal by the various instruments of international relations that democracy is the ideal of regimes. So we are monitoring and measuring the strength and the robustness and the pervasiveness of democracy as a form of government. But in effect, we have been, I think, very reluctant to see that many of the presuppositions of the superiority of democracy are eroding and have been eroding in the world and even in the West. 
the place where democracy used to be seen as the one and only ideal form of government. So I think that looking critically at democracy in the West is especially critical, and I don't need, I think, many supports for this, in addition to the econo econ economist uh, our review of democracy today. But if we look at maybe the strongest and the richest democracy in the state, a very stable democracy, starting with the Federalist Papers and the American Constitution, I think we can see that it's in trouble, not mainly in the sense that what we are seeing is very curious elections, but I think what we are seeing is the erosion of serious ideal of democracy, which is built on the combination of a robust freedom of expression, freedom of ideas in the life of a community, and a debate about the possibility of changing government together with a commitment to whatever government is elected and to a basic sense of cohesion and solidarity that inspires the political community to work together towards a shared good within a shared framework of democratic government. I think what we are seeing in the world now is a loss of belief in the assumptions of equality and freedom and the relevance of the voters. So we are seeing a lack of interest in participating in democracy, a fear that democracy is really governed by economic and political elites that do not care about the public interest, but about the interests of parts of the community. And I think what we are seeing now in America is establishment and anti-establishment candidates and the fact that establishment is losing the support and justification <laughs> and the faith and the trust of large parts of the population. And this is something that's very dangerous because it shows that we are moving towards populism on the one hand, very strengthened by communications, and towards a plea for strong people, for our people who will tell us the truth and work for our interest rather than say very nice things, but work for the tycoons. So I think this is a real challenge, and I think we need to look at the presuppositions of democracy. I still think democracy is a value, is an ideal, is very critical, but it needs much more justification and support and a look into its presuppositions than we have been giving it in the last uh, few uh, uh, years. So I'm very, very ha happy to open the uh, first uh, uh, panel of this uh, conference. And I invite the first speaker, who is Professor Michael Schaefer, who is also the convener of this conference. He studied philosophy and history at the Free University of Berlin at the University of Amsterdam was Professor and Jean Monnet Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence and Professor of Political Philosophy at the University of Amsterdam, University of Utrecht, and at the Amsterdam Institute for German Studies. He's a visiting professor at the University of Haifa, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Venice International University, and has been, sorry, uh, uh, and University of Milan. He's a fellow of the Netherlands uh, Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities and Social Sciences, and at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. So you see this is a very distinguished and prolonged career. He uh, was the guest of the president of the Berlin Social Science Center, He's a member of Executive Board at Society of European, the Culture in Venice, member of the Expert Committee of European Affairs and International Relations, German Social Democratic Party in Berlin. He recently has been working as an expert for the European Commission, Erasmus Program, the Hague in Brussels. Professor Schaeffer, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, may I change the computer there? Sorry? You need a presentation? Oh. You need a PowerPoint. Uh, oh, it's a PowerPoint. No, no, I don't need to present it, but my lecture is on, on, the, on, the, on the laptop. But I can, I can do it from here. First of all, um, 
My many things uh, go to the uh, very beautiful Van Leer uh, Jerusalem Institute. Uh, it's a very nice place, and it's an honor to be here. And my special uh, thanks um, goes to the director, Gabriel Motzki, and, uh, uh, and thank you for the warm hospitality. And to Shulamit Lavon, uh, who always was a reliable uh, and accurate support uh, in organizing this uh, conference. I wish all of us uh, two very interesting days. Ladies and gentlemen, those who speak about uh, democracy mean uh, always something good. Nowadays, every, everyone parades as a Democrat, waving the colors of true democracy against all other pretenders. Democracy as an idea is the most widely admired type of political system, but also perhaps the most difficult to maintain. Political regimes of all kinds of all kinds throughout the world describes themselves as democracies, and democracy has become the fundamental standard of political legitimacy in the current era. <coughs> However, historically, this is not evident. Democracy was and is a contest concept, at least as controversial as the concept of liberty. Democ democracy is strong in quantitative terms in the number of democracies in the world, but weak in qualitative terms in how well those democracies perform. Democracy in literal terms means nothing other than the rule by the people. And this is a message of people all over the world who are fed up with repressions and corruption, or those, as nowadays, who try to introduce a nationalist or populist conception of democracy in which the people is described as a homogeneous ethnical, cultural, or religious community. The term democracy derived, as everybody knows, from the Greek word demokratia, the root meanings of which are demos, people, and kratos, rule. But doubts about democracy viability go back to Aristotle, who regarded it as inherently unstable because of democracy's concept of equality which may not act in the best interests of the Greek city-states. So in fact, the very strict concept of democracy itself is morally empty. Suppose elections are free and fair and those elected are racists or fascists, said the former American diplomat Richard Holbrook about Yugoslavia in the 1990s. And he continued, that is a di dilemma, unquote. Indeed, it is. And Europe in the last century often was confronted with this dilemma, as Karl Schmidt stated in his book Die Geistesgeschichtliche Lage des heutigen Parlamentarismus, already before Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. He wrote, Bolshevism and fascism, by contrast, are like all dictatorships, certainly anti-liberal, but not necessarily anti-democratic, unquote. Yes, unfortunately, Nazism triumphed at the end of the Weimar Repub Republic, not despite the democratization of political life, but because of it. Thus was John Adams, uh, oh no, governments produced by elections may be corrupt, short-sighted, irresponsible, dominated by special or ideological interests, are not capable of adapting policies demanded by the public good. These qualities make such governments unwanted, but they do not make them undemocratic. Thus was John Adams, America's second president, right when he once pronounced that democracy murders itself and that there never was a democracy that did not commit suicide. Fortunately, Adams, for the time being, was wrong. Democracy, at least the Western type, was a great victor of the ideological clashes of the last century between fascism, communism, and liberalism. Following the American uh, political uh, scientist Robert Dahl, we may roughly distinguish between two main currents in democratic thought, the populist and the pluralist one. Since at least the 17th century, the ancient Greek model of direct de democracy has been challenged by an alternative liberal model of democracy. 
The first uh, tradition prefers to expound de democracy in literal terms, favoring direct popular rule, political equality, and majority rule, harboring deep suspicions, suspicions about professionalized uh, politics and elite representation. The second tradition, however, liberal democracy means a political system marked not only by free and fair elections, but also by the rule of law, separations of powers, and the protection of basic political rights and, liberal, uh, liber uh, and, and civil liberties. That was historically, of course, a long process realized, realized step by step. This cluster of fundamental freedoms, including the division of powers, what might be termed also constitutional democracy has little to do with democracy in the strict sense. With these principles with, which must complement democratic uh, elections and political participation, a solution was found for the so-called paradox of democracy, namely that the majority has the possibility to abolish democracy or what Alexis de Tocqueville once called the danger of tyranny of the majority. Democracy, democracies with their concept of the so-called militant democracy learned, especially in post-war West Germany, to build barriers of self-disempowerment, an idea that dates back with the crucial innovation which Hans Kelsen had called constitutional techniques. Constitutional courts, one of the most important institutional creations of the 20th century, were to protect, protect this new order as a whole especially by safeguarding civil rights. These are mostly also to be out of reach of parliaments and grounded in natural law, law or other systems of so-called objective values, which, by the way, directly contradicted one of Kelsen's major philosophical positions, namely that uh, democracy necessarily entailed a form of value <coughs> relativism. However, However, Kelsen defended judicial review as a necessary supplement of checks and balances. He did not concede that it might be inherently undemocratic, as many opponents were to claim. In the early 1930s, in a major controversial dispute with Carl Schmitt, Kelsen concluded that only such a court could be the ultimate guardian of democracy. Constitutional courts were therefore also instrumental in the rise of militant democracy after the Second World War, a concept that had been first defined by the German exiled political scientist Karl Löwenstein in, uh, in 1938, at the time when one European country after another had been taken over fascist or authoritarian movements using democratic means to disable democracy. Löwenstein had argued that democracies were not able of defending themselves against such movements because they had no proper intellectual content, content and with which democracies could never complete, uh, compete on its own terms. Consen consequently, democracies had to take legal measures against anti-democratic forces, such as banning parties and or restricting the rights to assembly or free speech. As Löwenstein concluded, fire should be fought with fire, and that fire, in his view, could be lit only by a new disciplined democracy. Although militant democracy was, or wehrhafte Demokratie, was most pronounced in West Germany, the imperative of democratic self-defense became widespread across Western Europe. For example, in Ita Italy, the Christian Democrats sought to establish a protected democracy una democrazia protetta, that was to restrict civil liberties, but also was to justify electoral laws benefiting major parties. Once more, the theory and the reality of militant democracy differed markedly, and the concept of a militant de democracy has to learn to deal with the paradox that it has to fight its enemies without becoming similar to them. Despite these inherent feeling, uh, failings of uh, liberal democracies, democracy and liberty has become mer merged over the last half century in Europe and other parts of the Western world. But today, the two strands of liberal democracy are again coming apart across the globe. 
and the globalization of democracy involves a vexing paradox. The apparent moral attractiveness of democracy has been recognized by either governments or their opponents with almost every state, but there is less widespread enthusiasm for the liberal principles which in Western states underpins the practice of democracy, at least on paper. Where autocrats and dictators have been driven out of office, their opponents have mostly failed to create a viable democratic regimes. They reduce democracy to the procedure of democratic elections without suffi sufficient institutional gar guarantees that assure that those elections are meaningful according to fundamental political rights and principles. But even in established democracies, flaws in the system have become visible and this illusion looked as though it, it would dominate the world. In the second half of the last century, democracies had taken root in the most difficult circumstances possible. In Germany, after 12 long years of Nazi dictatorship, in India, which had the largest population of poor people in the world, and in the 1990s in South Africa, which had been disfigured of, uh, by apartheid. Independency created new democracies in Africa and Asia, and autocratic regimes in Greece, Spain, Argentina, and Chile gave way to democracy in the 1970s and 80s. The collapse of the Soviet empire created many fledgling new democracies in Eastern Central Europe as, as well. Freedom House, an American think tank, classified approximately 125 countries or around 63% of the world as democracies. But democracy's problems, meanwhile, run deeper than numbers suggest. Because we have to consider that the minimal requirement for a state listed as a democracy by Freedom House is that of so-called elector electoral democracy, what merely entails that the selection of the ruling elite is based on the former right to vote. Josef Schumpeter, who employed this kind of narrow division, definition of democracy, is the basis, mostly the basis of these successful statistics and what we have to consider if we speak about the third wave of democratization. However, the progress we have seen in the late 20th century has stalled in the 21st century. Even though almost half of the world's population, more people than ever before, live in countries that would hold more or less free and fair elections. Democracy, global advance has come to a halt and may even have gone into reverse. Freedom House reckons that 2015 was the ninth year in which the condition of uh, global political rights and civil liberties declined. Between 1980s and 2000s, the cause of democracy experienced only a few setbacks but since 2000, they have uh, many. So in the econ economist, uh, according to the eco economists, we had uh, three main uh, setbacks. The first setback was in Russia, uh, where, uh, meanwhile, Putin's uh, kleptocratic uh, regime destroyed uh, the substance of democracy in Russia, muzzling the press and imprisoning his opponents. Uh, and I will say, I. I think we will hear more about uh, when Professor Schlöger will uh, speak tomorrow. Also about the effective alliance between Russia and the new Western European right. The next setback was the Iraq war, uh, when Saddam Hussein's fabled weapons and of mass destruction failed to give instead to justifying the war as a fight for freedom and democracy. He believed that the Middle East would remain a breeding ground for terrorism so long as it was dominated by dictators. But the military, as we know, intervention to promote democracy did the democratic cause great harm. Many, not only left-wingers, regarded it as a proof that democracy was just a fig leaf for American imperialism trying to impose its own model of capitalism. But instead, uh, okay, uh, a third setback was Egypt. The collapse of uh, Mubarak's regime in 2011, after huge protests, raised hopes that democracy would spread in the Middle East. But the enthusiasm soon turned to despair. 
the, the elections were won not by liberal activists or citizens activists who were hopeless divided, but by the Muslim Brotherhood Party. The new president, Morsi, treated democracy as a winner takes all system and granted himself almost unlimited powers. In July uh, 2013, the army stepped in, arrested the first, the first elected president and other leading members of the Brotherhood Party. Along with civil war in Syria and anarchy in Iraq and Libya, this has dashed the hope that the Arab Spring would lead, lead to democracies across the Middle East. Only Tunisia can set a strong positive example for the region as a full as the only full-fledged Arabic democracy. Meanwhile, some recent recruits of, to the democratic camp or other countries in the Middle East have lost their glamour as well. Since the introduction of democracy in 1994, South Africa has been ruled by the same party, the African National Congress, which has become more and more self-serving. Israel, which is seen as the only democratic regime in the whole Middle East region, so surrounded by autocratic regimes, is confronted more and more with the contradictions between the Jewish Zionist character of the Israeli state and the treatment vis-a-vis -vis the Arab fellow citizens on the one hand and the, growing, uh, uh, and the growing inequalities of income and property also among the Jewish population on the other. Turkey, a key partner of the European Union and the NATO, which once seemed to combine moderate Islam with prosperity and democracy, is descending more and more into corruption and auto auto autocracy. Erdogan's regime is trying to destroy the substance of democracy, mothering the purse, trying to do so also abroad, and stepped up its yelling of human rights activists, journalists, and other perceived enemies. All this together demo demonstrates that building the institutions needed to sustain democracy is very slow and difficult work indeed and has dispelled the once popular notion that democracy will blossom rapidly once the seed is planted. Although democracy may be a universal aspiration, as many from the West insist, it remains a culturally and histor historically rooted practice. But what we may call the heartlands of actually existing liberal democracies, recession, austerity, austerity and a declining productive ec economy have challenged the legitimacy of political institutions in the West as well. In the eyes of eminent political social scientists, the main threat of democracy is uh, today's finance capitalism, which increases the inequality of incomes, assets, and of properties on the one hand, and the decline of political participation on the other. Wolfgang Merkel from the Berlin Social Science Center believes that the growing socioeconomic inequality has negative effects on voter participation, which is declining in many countries, including Germany, and is in a socio-economic term highly selective. Heinz Bude, a German social scientist, detects in Germany an increasing level of exclusion of the lower third of the demos from participation and an inferior representation of their interests. New or direct forms of political participation, such as NGOs, referenda, or citizen councils, are socially much more selective than the ailing institutions of representative democracy. The British uh, political scientist Colin Crouch holds that we live in a post-democratic age in which democracy has largely lost its former substance. According to him, we are dealing with, a, to a, some extent, careless surrender of the state's capacity to regulate and intervene in an eco economy that creates inequality principle of political equality. The German social scientist Wolfgang Streeck observes only democratic facades which deprives, deprives parliaments and national governments of some of their previous power. <coughs> Last but not least, Chantal Mouffe, a Belgian political scientist, believes that in Europe today our priority should be to revive 
the left-right confrontation and to create the condition for an, uh, what she called agonistic democracy. And contrary to those who argue that the solution to our dilemma resides in the establishment of a cosmopolitan post-national world order, which she sees as a political illusion, MOVE is convinced that what, that what is required is the development of a pluralistic world order in which the dem democratic idea can be implemented <coughs> according to different contexts. Indeed, the Gesundheit. <laughs> Indeed, the damages of today's dominant financial capitalism have tremendous impact. They contradict democratic expectations of fairness and justice, not just among mentioned political or social scientists and many other intellectuals, but also within the populations at large, which seem to be less tolerant vis-a-vis -vis huge income and property inequalities compared with former times. Okay, I think I, I will succeed. It revealed fundamental weaknesses in the Western political system, systems, undermining the self-confidence that had been one of their great assets. Governments had steadily extended entitlements over decades, allowing dangerous levels to debt to develop, and politicians, politicians came to believe that they had tamed risk. Many people became and still become frustrated with the workings of their political and economic systems, particularly when governments bailed out bankers with taxpayers' money and then stood by impotently as bankers continued to pay themselves uh, huge bonuses. <coughs> also, also, the European Union is not always a good example of democracy. The decision to de introduce the euro, euro in 1999 was ta taken largely by technocrats. Only two countries, Denmark and Sweden, held referenda on the important matter. Both, by the way, said no. Efforts to win popular, <coughs> approval for the, uh, popular approval for the Lisbon Treaty, which gave Brussels more power, were abandoned when people started voting, voting the wrong way. During the darkest days of the Euro crisis, the European Commission and the European Council forced Italy and Greece to replace elected leaders with technocrats. The European Parliament, in an attempt to fix Europe's democratic deficit, is both often ignored and despised. For these reasons, but also for many others, as the current neoliberal profile with the emphasis on first and foremost <coughs> market freedoms, the European Union has become a breeding ground for many self-proclaimed freedom parties of such as Geert Wilders Party for Freedom in the Netherlands, the Freedom Party of Austria, Marine Le Pen's Front National in France, or the Alternative für Deutschland, which all together claim to defend in the name of freedom ordinary people against an so-called arrogant and incompetent national and European elite. However, the desire for freedom is first of all di directed against Islam, against paying taxes and against the European Union. In doing so, they demonstrate often only a minimal understanding of complex national and international issues and have no serious proposals for how to address them. <coughs> A good recent example for these developments of populist strategies is the Dutch so-called Ukraine-European Union Association Agreement Referendum. The name is uh, already uh, very difficult. Held last month with which the treaty's opponents were using stereotypes, half-truths and demeaning propaganda against Ukraine and whereby, whereby the true goal of the referendum was to attack Europe's unity. In an interview with the so-called European Committee of Citizens, Bürgerkomitee Europäische Uni, the members admitted that they didn't really care about the Ukraine at all, but they are in fact against the political system of the European Union, 
Accordingly, accordingly, most of the Ukraine opponents use the referendum mainly as a chance to demonstrate their dissatisfaction with the European Union, instead of confining their deliberations to the contents of the treaties and agreements. On the contrary, while such populist, populist or protest parties or committees citizen committees generally defend the rules of the democratic game, preferring to win elections or referenda. Parties such as Jobbik, Jobbik in Hungary, Gordon Dawn in Greece, or the Slovak National Party, remind us of fascist movements which to tend, tend to favor an overthrow of the democratic system, clearly flirting with the use of political violence. All in all, we have to state that an ambitious European transnational project, once designed to tame the beast of populism and right-wing extremism, is instead poking it back into life. To understand these developments, we have to recognize that since the dawn of the modern democ democracy in the late 19th century, democracy has expressed itself through nation states and national parliaments. But this arrangement is now under assault from various sides. During the last decades, we have seen a weakening of national parliaments because the democratic process is superimposed by structures of national, transnational governance, which has changed national politics profoundly. National politi politicians have surrendered even more power to unelected technocrats, for example, over global financial flows or to global markets, and might thus find that they are unable to keep promises they have made to voters during the national election campaigns. The number of countries with independent central banks, for example, which dictate economic and financial policy has increased today from about 20 in, okay, uh, in 1980 to more than 160. International institutions and organizations as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization, or the European Union have extended their influence because there is a compelling reason for this. How can a single country deal today with global problems and global risks? In sum, globalization and transnationalization have strengthened the governments mostly at the cost of parliaments, which have lost some of their legislative powers. But what governments have gained in power vis-a-vis -vis parliaments, on the one side, they have lost to the markets and financial actors on the other side. Taking these developments in account, there is no doubt that liberal democracy today faces serious challenges, especially in regards to problems of participation and representation. With regard to the electoral regime, we are confronted with the challenge that there is a moderate, as in Western Europe, or drastic, as in East Central European states, decline in voter turnout. While the gender gap is nearly closed, selectivity in terms of social class has considerably increased. So socioeconomic inequality during the last three decades has been transformed into a higher inequality of cognitive resources and political knowledge. The now the political knowledge, the fewer voters are able to translate their interests and in appropriate voting preferences. The more unequal a society, the more people are unwilling or unable to participate meaningfully in the context of elections. All other, also other forms of participation, such as referenda, un, are unable to stop this political exclusion. Since they are politically more demanding than voting, good examples are the Dutch European Constitution referendum or from 2005, or the already mentioned Dutch Ukraine referendum, uh, Dutch Ukraine European Union referendum, they often are socially even more exclusive. With regard to political rights, whose institutions institutional core is the right to political communication and organization, we are confronted with a new constellation of the European party system, which has been changing the, in the last two decades profoundly. The tra traditional catch-all parties, a good English translation uh, uh, 
by the way, from the uh, political scientist Otto Kirchheimer uh, for the German word uh, Volksparteien, are in decline which more specialized, specialized populist or protest parties have emerged. However, party membership and trust in political parties in general is declining across the Western world. For example, only 1% of British citizens are now members of political parties compared with 20% in the 1950s. <coughs> but if the same citizens are asked how much trust they have in police, the army, or the legal system, the percentages are, are in almost every country, European country, much higher than for democracy's core institutions. Voter turnout is failing as well. A study of 49 democracies found that it had declined by 10 percentage points between 2007 and 14. A recent survey of several European countries found that more than half of voters had no trust in government whatsoever. An opinion poll of British voters in the same year found that 62% agreed that politicians tell lies all the time and that their votes do not count. The same negative opinions about politicians and also about the so-called lying press, die Lügenpresse, we can find meanwhile also in Germany and in the Netherlands two other stable democracies so far. Social media have changed behavior of communication and participation. Shitstorms on internet ask from governments to give citizens what they want in a very short time, while neglecting long-term considerations or complex processes of decision-making. At, at the same time, internet gives citizens access to sources of independent and critical information that are difficult for governments to control or censor. In information that governments would rather keep secret. But the reaction of governments didn't take long. Restrictions on internet freedom have long been less severe than those imposed on tra traditional media, but meanwhile the gap is closing as government track down on, only, on online activity. Two minutes, okay. Um, With regard to the horizontal accountability of power, we are confronted with challenges which leads to the weakening of national parliaments. Also, with regard to East Central European member states, the center-right Fidesz party pioneered a new European illiberal wave after the Berlusconi cabinet in the 1990s and Poland between 2005 and 2007. When the Fidesz party came to power in 2010, they limited the power of the constitutional court, pacted with cronies, and introduced a new constitution. Um, so I have to finish. Uh, also, the, uh, another good example for uh, this kind of illiberal demo democracy can be, of course, find in, in Poland. In some, so we can say, Democratic, uh, democratic development, like democratic culture, requires a considerable measure of balance between opposition and dissent on the one hand, and willingness to cooperation and to compromise, trust in fellow political actors, and respect for other interests on the other. But the longer dictatorships have been established in a country and have had the chance to influence the political culture of society, the more likely are the effects in the subsequent democracy. Um, okay, we will come to a conclusion. Democracy seems to be inescapable linked to a permanent crisis or at least to permanent challenges. This is true since the ancient writings of Plato and Aristotle. Many of the problems that democracy has experienced <coughs> from the beginning are tensions that inhere in democracy's, democracy's very nature, <coughs> namely, first of all, the most basic tension between conflict and consensus. Democracy is, by its nature, a system of institutionalized competition of power. 
Without competition and conflict, there is no demo democracy. Hence, the paradox, democracy requires conflict, but not too much. Competition, there must be, but only within carefully defined and accepted boundaries. In other words, democracy implies dissent and division, but on basis of consent and cohesion. Cleavage must be tempered by consensus. However, consensus and cohesion are very fragile in an age of political and economic crisis, transnational governance and global protests. No one living in an established liberal democracy should be self-confident -conf about the necess necessity of its survival. There is no automatic historical mechanism, no objective guise in history and the meaning of Hegel's philosophy that creates regular progress or that prevents decay or backsliding. Democracies, even provided with basic freedoms and underpinned with in, inter institutional and constitutional guarantees, exist and survive only because people want and are willing to fight for them, thereby taking into account that democracy remains always an open project and incomplete in its never-ending quest for a better society. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry that we have to cut some of the papers a bit short because we would like to have some opportunity for discussion. Obviously, the written papers that will be published will be uh, uh, full and will hopefully include some benefit from the uh, short discussion that we are going to have uh, as part of our uh, conference. And I want to thank Professor Schaefer for a marvelous introductory lecture mapping out uh, in a very good comparative broad way the challenges of democracy uh, in the West where liberal democracies are more powerful and uh, affecting obviously uh, other parts of the globe. And I would like to uh, uh, open uh, the, the session uh, for a short, to a short discussion. What we'll do is take a few comments and then uh, allow Professor Schaefer to address them. So, but please be short, concise, and uh, uh, okay. Thank you, and then you. Okay. I think you need a microphone. Uh, well, also thank uh, Professor Schaefer for describing the problems. Uh, my background is in the, the classical world, especially classical philosophy, and. Um, <laughs> Interestingly, there is a, amongst those classical scholars who've written on the political philosophy, there is a consensus that the t term democracy is misapplied today in general, because most of the so-called democracies are in fact based on uh, the Roman constitution at its peak, say in the second century before Christ, which was uh, an oligarchic constitution. Uh, and so what you describe as liberal democracy should rather be called liberal oligarchy, uh, and that the competition that you refer to is always a competition between oligarchies, the 20 people at the top of one party or the 20 people at the top of another party. And even the United States where the Congress has more power than usual, you're dealing with perhaps 700 people uh, who are making all the decisions in the country. Uh, and once one realized we was dealing with oligarchy, we come back to the point of Dr. Motskin, uh, that the important thing is that the oligarchies uh, should be well educated. And maybe one of the things being neglected in the, the, the attempt to democratize uh, education and to get rid of elite schools and so on and so forth and to uh, downgrade elite universities, uh, maybe this is uh, something which uh, lies at the roots of the problems you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, it is not uh, well known that pirate ships were governed by democracies. It, that uh, sprang uh, spontaneously. A pirate ship, uh, if a pirate uh, wanted to join a ship, he had to sign the articles of the ship and the captain was not uh, um, the, the king mm. because uh, if uh, a, a, a 
commercial ship was spotted, then the pirates were convened to vote whether to pursue and attack the ship. And there was also a division of power between the captain and the, uh, uh, how, how should I translate, the Rava Malachim. Okay, so, and it seems, I mean, th so this was... Pro you know, they have a liberal concept of democracy, <laughs> a division of powers. On yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, if the captain wanted to punish someone... So the it, question is... No, it, well, it, it's not a question. Okay. It's a comment, as you, uh, you allowed comments. It seems that this type of democracy was fairly stable, and the reason could be that information was flowing uh, uh, much uh, 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 better than in a large democracy, which is uh, a people. No, so it could be that uh, the stable element here in, in democracy is, is really fluctuation between uh, one end of a democracy, a full democracy, and an autocracy, and it fluctuates all the time. You know, because we, we had uh, examples like, for example, even France, you know, French Revolution, then came Napoleon and, and, and made it back into a monarchy, and then it became a democracy again. So uh, there is this fluctuation. This is a stable element, and one is a threat, I mean, one type is a threat to the other, not to go too far. Sometimes it goes too far, but uh, usually it does not. Thanks. Uh, we, we're going to take uh, two more, uh, one here, and, uh, and uh, you first, and then, uh, and then you, and, and that's it. I'm sorry, Bibi, we have some. My name is Hajo Funke. I have a question or a small comment. Uh, if this is the case, what you described, the economic inequality and a centralized way of uh, deciding in the EU, for example, and a kind of uh, uh, distant mentality to democracy, then I want to know where is the way out. Uh, do you see chances to contain that? I agree with all your critics, but I want to, to, to hear something maybe utopian, but that can be a way out, be it in Israel or Europe or in Germany. And the last one, please. I have, <coughs> excuse me. I have a practical question, a real question, about what goes on around us today. Now, we are watching a situation where a party was elected as a major party in order to uh, get uh, the leadership, the government. It had to create a coalition. Now, the prime minister is prime minister, but the party doesn't get any of the important uh, ministerial positions. Now, was that situation a case that you can define by the electoral process as a democracy? Thank you very much. <laughs> Lots of questions. Now, the question was very simple. Uh, the people okay. were, uh, have elected according to a certain program, and the government is run by the minor parties. Fine. No, no. I want I want to add one general question to the uh, uh, discussion here. We talked about about the distinction between procedural democracy and liberal democracy, and I would like to. I mean, this is in fact part of the problem of extending democracy from the West to other countries where they have maybe only procedural and not enough liberal tradition and things like that. I want to ask. What do you mean by liberal here? Do you mean liberal in terms of human rights, separation of powers, the rule of law? Or do you mean liberal vis-a-vis -vis conservative? Because we see, I think, in the world today, both in the West and outside the West, 
uh, uh, a, a rethinking of the relationship between state and religion. And religion usually is seen as not a necessarily very liberal force. And the question of the introduction of religion back into state structure in the public realm is, I think, something that maybe we should think about when we think about modern challenges for democracy. So you have uh, not a very long time to address all these questions. <laughs> well, um, um, to answer your question, because liberal, I'm meaning in the kind of liberal political philosophy, uh, it seems we see political rights and liber <coughs> civil liberties and so, and so on. So it's, and, it's and that, is, it's, and is that means it. that means uh, 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 a kind of neutrality, neutral to other, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, ideologies or religions, and that is the, po the problem what we can have when in, in a state, in a given state, uh, a religious has, uh, is one of the main factors of uh, uh, political thinking in society or in government. So, um, about um, your question, I, I think I have to be short. Um, yeah, it's a good question, and um, uh, you triggered a very weak point in my um, presentation, and uh, I don't really have a solution for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, uh, yeah, you can say your smaller community uh, uh, a better uh, democracy uh, will function, and so on, and so on. Um, mm, I. Also, the, the question about uh, referenda and uh, elections uh, in the rep representative uh, democracy, it's, it's a kind of dilemma what I have described. But I think we, uh, although we have uh, some problems with uh, what I had described with the uh, uh, referenda, we need much more for the European questions because the citizens are uh, really uh, involved with these questions in their daily life. And I think uh, in, in this, um, in the European question, in the question of the European Union, it's necessary that we need uh, much more referenda on and very specific uh, uh, political questions. Um, uh, and uh, I think about uh, the euro, we need it. Uh, referendum. Uh, we had the need to, to, to ask uh, citizens in Europe whether they want it. Um, okay, that is a very short answer. Thank you very much uh, uh, for a very uh, uh, inspiring uh, opening uh, talk. And now